All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome, church. It's good to see you all back here in the sanctuary at 10 o'clock in the morning. I love it. And those that are joining us online just for the sermon, welcome, welcome, welcome back. We have been in, this, in a series about the letter of James, and today we're entering into James chapter 2. And before I, I dive right into James, and I will forewarn you today that, uh, that it, it is pretty text heavy, um, and this is, I'm really excited about James. But before we jump into James, who knows some stuff about James? I'd just like to set some reminders out there. Okay, all the hands are up. I can't even believe it. I don't know who to call on right there. Well, I'll help you out. Oh, you got one? Boom, Jesus' half-brother. Yes, so Jesus, well, half-brother because his mother and father are Mary and Joseph, right? And Jesus' mother and father are his earthly mother is Mary, and his father is God, so that makes James his half-brother. And Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters, and we think that there may even be a third. So one of the things that excites me about James is that, um, you know, James really knows his brother well. He was with him in, in all the major turning points of his life, and you can even think like James and Jesus, you know, shared an outhouse, right, without running water. And you know if you have siblings or have had to share a bathroom with someone, what that can do, and you learn lots of uh, things about that person. So James really knows Jesus very well. Also, James was the founding pastor of the church in Jerusalem, Kind of a, a big job there because they're all Jews. Their Messiah has just come. And so James is, is working with what are called Messianic Jews, Jews that realize that Jesus was the Messiah. And oh, by the way, he's also my brother kind of thing, right? Um, and so James knows a lot about Jesus. And last week we learned together that this one thing to listen and receive the word of God. And then it's really another thing to act on the word of God. And so let's just stop here for a minute and realize why God created us. Why did God create you? Well, God is, a, is the yin and the yang, the beginning and the end, all that is, that was, that, that is yet to come. God never changes. God didn't create you because he needs you to exist. And God did not create a robot. He could have done that, right? But he created you. So he created you with a purpose, with a distinct purpose. He created you for two reasons. One, because he wants a relationship with you. And two, because he loves you. So it's logical to think if you want the life that God, the creator of the universe, designed for you, and if you want to be living the best life that God created, then we must learn to be people of action, to respond to his word, not just to hear it, but to respond. And James develops this this morning by comparing the relationship between faith and works. And this draws the attention of, of pastors and theologians across the planet, right, ever since this has happened, because not only do we believe and, and know that this is the centerpiece of the book of James, but really it is a, a pivotal doctrine of the Bible, of biblical scripture. Faith that works. Let's pray on this one. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service. And we pray that the meditation of our hearts and all of my words are experienced by everyone, whether spoken or unspoken. Father, speak to us now. You are our rock and our redeemer. May the Holy Spirit speak in and through all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see. Faith and, and works. And some of us may be sitting around and go, well, that's a no-brainer. I mean, if you're faithful, then you have to have works. Then you have to do stuff, apply your faith. But let's see what, what some of the foremost theologians on the planet, right? Uh, let's look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor, a theologian, an anti-Nazi. He even went back to fight the Nazis, right? He says, faith without works is not faith at all, but a simple lack of obedience to God. 
Charles Spurgeon, known as the prince of all preachers, he says faith and works are bound up in the same bundle, right? In the same file folder. <clears throat> he that obeys God trusts God. And he that trusts God obeys God. He that is without faith is without works. And he that is without works is without faith. Okay, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorites. And by the way, there's a play coming to town, C.S. Lewis, um, in, the, in the downtown um, Performing Arts Center that's supposed to be great in Fort, if you're in Fort Lauderdale. Um, C.S. Lewis, theologian from Oxford, from Cambridge, the Chronicles of Nardia you may recognize, right? And, and he wrote the book Mere Christianity. He says, regarding the debate about faith and works, it's like asking which blade in a pair of scissors is most important. So I think, really, is there a debate? I mean, should I just be, oh, okay, I'm done. I mean, is there really a debate about faith and, and works? Well, it sure seems that there is in, in James's time, right? Because he's pastoring to this church in Jerusalem. And when you think about it today, there is definitely an ongoing debate. Just look at our world. Do you demonstrate faith through your actions? And the building goes silent. Think about it. If I were to ask someone to give me an example of your faith, aside from saying, hey, they check the box every week, they go to church, would they say, oh yeah, they belong to a community of faith? What would they tell me about you? Does your faith manifest itself in your works? I mean, is, is, debate even there? is the debate even there? Well, I'm going to let you come to your own conclusions, and we're going to dive deeply into James because he has a lot to say about this. Please listen as we hear the word of God. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is use useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So James makes several comparisons in this. I mean, there is so much in that, and, and we're going to dissect that here today. And he gives solid examples of this. And if you're, a, if you're a nerd like me and want to see more examples of this, you can go to Hebrews 11 and you'll see a whole list of, of people that pursued faith and works. So let's jump into that first verse of the day. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? It seems like a no-brainer. To me. But let's talk about saving faith. I mean, these two questions in one verse here are what C.S. Lewis called the debate about faith and works. 
And James gives practical examples of this throughout the Bible. Let me, let me ask you all today, what good is, it, is all the faith in the world if it doesn't move you to action? I mean, what good is it if, if, if I say, I mean, imagine I'm, I'm like that, that cowboy, right? And I mean, this guy, you can hand him a ream of paper and go write the Bible and he'd probably get pretty close. I mean, what good is it if you've got all your faith memorized, but you do nothing about it? I mean, can a person with an inactive faith truly be saved eternally? It's a big question. Think about it. God has given you all sorts of blessings. You know what they are. I mean, some of us have, have the blessing of song. Did you hear Amanda sing? Like, really? Some of us have, have a blessing of personality. Some of us have a blessing of professionalism. Some of us have a blessing of a lot of money. Some of us have a blessing of being the best parents in the world. Some of us have a, a blessing of, of cleaning cars. I don't know what it is. But whatever your blessings are, if you were God and you had given you those blessings, would you continue to give you blessings? Are you using those blessings to help other people, to help the planet, to help your church, to make this place a better world to live in, or are you hoarding it? Are you holding on to that stuff? And then it's kind of hard to, to figure out when you're thinking this whole faith and works things, right? Because we have the scripture in Ephesians, and, and if you meet with me someday, or, or I mention it a lot in, in worship, I'll say, hey, do you know how you're getting to heaven? Kind of important, right? How are you getting to heaven? By the grace of God. By the grace of God. There's nothing you can do that earns your way into heaven. And let me tangent here for a minute, because this is what separates Christianity from all other, most other religions. Right? Most other religions will say, you have to get some level of education, or you have to do X, Y, or Z. You have these works. And eventually you will earn your way to eternal salvation. Christianity says, uh-uh. You got it wrong. Christianity says it is not what you do. It is what has already been done for you. Jesus paid the price for you. There's nothing you can do to earn yourself to heaven. So this grace and works thing may throw you off. It says, for grace, in Ephesians, by grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay, makes sense. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, case in point. Not a result of your works, so that no one may boast. God is not concerned with the grandeur of your work. Rather, your heart and the love by which you do it. Now, it's clear from the scripture that salvation comes through faith alone, not as a result of anything that you do, right? But then we got James saying a faith-filled person will be and is a person of righteous action, does stuff. And I've heard it say another way. I've, I've heard it say that we are not saved by good works. We aren't saved by that stuff, but we are saved to good works. And once you're saved, your righteous actions, your, your, the works of the day, your day-to-day -day stuff that you do, shows a transformation in your mind and heart and soul. That's that transformation that's happening in you through the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ gives us a, a divine word on this topic because you, you kind of say, okay, Jesus, well, faith and works. Let's look at what he says in in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, right in the middle of it. He says, beware of false prophets. Ah, the king of lies is a smart guy. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Do you know them? <laughs> Have you had some of those in your life? <laughs> I know. I got a couple ex-girlfriends in that category. Yeah. You will recognize them by their fruits. 
right? Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or, or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the fire burns. So we're going to recognize them by their fruits. We're going to recognize people by their works, by the fruits of the Spirit. You'll recognize them by the fruits of their lives. Here's a better question for you. What is your legacy? Ah, what are you leaving behind? If God were to call you home right now and we're here for a minute, what would people say about you? Would they say, man, they had a lot of stuff. Weren't they cool? You're not taking this stuff with you. Or would they say, wow, look what they did with their life. Look at the fruit they bear. They had these, these great kids, or they, they helped this, or they, they, they helped the hungry. They went down, they helped hurricane victims. They helped their church. They belonged to a community of faith. They made this world a better place. Who cares what kind of car they got? We we'll recognize them by their fruit. I mean, this is amazing insight from Christ, and it's so simple, it's so straightforward, it's, it's just so practical. So we're not supposed to judge others because that's what God does. But we are, mm, delicious, <laughs> invited to be fruit inspectors. That's a good apple. So we can expect that there's going to be fruit from life for those who follow Jesus. But not every tree produces good fruit. And that is a good apple. So it's not that your works save you, but rather once you are saved, have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that today if you're online or right here in the sanctuary. But once you're saved, the kingdom works follow through you. Think about it. If you're walking around going, oh man, I'm coming towards the end of my life. There's an old lady who needs to cross the street. Let me help her cross the street. Because if I help that old lady cross the street, God going to see me and go, well, you know, you helped the old lady cross the street. Come on up here. That's not how it works. The idea is, once you are saved, that transformation that's happened inside you, when you see that same old lady, you're going to say, I want to help Mabel. Is that an old lady name? I don't know. Is that a good one? Mabel. Let's go with that. I want to help her cross the street. It's just going to come out of you. It's, it's going to pour out of your veins. I want to give you some solid examples of this because James really drives this home over and over. And please be reflecting on yourself. Let's look at the next section of James. And he's making a comparison and he's giving examples to make this point. His very first point in verse 215 says that if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace. And be warmed and filled. Isn't that nice? Without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? That is faith without action. Now, there's a, a give and take here, right? I mean, if any of you have, are familiar with 12-step programs or anything like that, you don't necessarily want to take all their troubles away. You may want them to step on their own two feet. And the way that you're showing your faith is that you are letting them stand on their own two feet. But I digress. James makes this personal here. And it is. He's talking to you. Talking to you. Come to church. There's a seat right there for you. Right there. He's talking to you. 
What if you see a, a brother or a sister in need, someone that you worship with, some, someone that you know is faithful, that's part of your, your church body, if you see this person in need and you try to help them with mere words but nothing else, is your faith real? Or maybe you say it this way, is your faith impacting your daily walk? Does it make you uncomfortable sometimes? I mean, one of the first things we're told when we get into seminary is, hey, you can plan out your whole day. Pastors are some of the busiest people you will ever meet, trust me. You can plan out your whole day. But at any point, God will just, the phone will ring or someone will walk into your office and God will pull you away. That's how faith works. And it says, in the same way, says James, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. All right, let's think about it. Practical example, we walk out on the dock back here and there's a fish laying on a dock. You walk over and go, dead. And someone walks next to you and says, no, are you kidding that thing's still alive? He said, alive, no way. It's a, not moving. No, 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 it's alive, I, go, I know it's alive but it still doesn't do anything. It still doesn't move. At some point, you go and look at the fish and you're gonna say, sushi, right? There's no logical reason that fish is alive. Grill it up. That is faith without works. If the thing isn't moving, if you're not moving in your life, you don't have works. It's like dead faith, sushi. James 2.18, let's move on, says, but someone will say, there's always someone, right? <laughs> Where are, there's always someone. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Oh, there's always that one guy. There's always that one person in your life, right, that's going to challenge you. Nope, I, I know my faith. So I don't have to demonstrate it. I got the whole Bible managed. I'm gonna go rob a bank tomorrow. But I know, my, I know my faith. So if I say to you, show me your faith apart from works, what would you show me? What would you point to? And then I love it, we say God is one. Yes, God is one by definition. And so if God is one, by definition, faith and works would have to be one. But we have to be very careful here because, you know, we have an enemy. We have a king of lies, and he, and he loves to deceive us, and he uses it against us. It says in James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The king of all lies seeks to kill and destroy and their actions are unrighteous. And the fruit of their existence is rotten. And I can tell you from personal experience, there's power in the name of Jesus. Use it. And this is an issue that James starts getting fired up about. And we see in, in verse 220, he says, do you, want to, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is, youth, is useless? Apparently, whatever is going on in the church, now stay with me here, because I, I think we may have some similar things going on here today. Whatever's going on in the church there in Jerusalem is wearing thin on James because people know about faith. There are enough Bibles printed in every language that every single person on the planet could have a Bible. Everyone. In some countries, if you do, they kill you. But let's get back to the text. Maybe James was tired of trying to inspire people to action. Hey, you know your faith, but you're still walking with the Pharisees. You're still walking with that ego and that higher than mighty and, and you're not humble. 
and the power and the greed, but you know what the, the faith is. I mean, maybe his congregation was just too comfortable in their lives. Wow, do we get comfortable in our lives, don't we? Maybe Jesus felt he, maybe James felt he wanted to see faith in action. Who's seen our church bus? Oh, yeah. You're too cold to raise your hand? I'm telling you. On the back of our church bus, it says faith in action. And there's a giant cross, right? James is calling for, for faith in action. He wanted to see faith in action and act, actually witness what people were doing in their lives. So James goes right to the heart of it. He says, I, I know my congregation. They're Jewish. They're Messianic Jews. I'm going I'm to go right to the heart of that. And he talks about Abraham. So do we as Christians. And what happens to Abraham in obedience to the Lord? It says in James 2, 21 through 23, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Abraham's taken his son and he's going to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. He's going to kill his own son. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Are you a friend of God? Abraham had incredible faith. Can you imagine what that is? Take your son. And it was demonstrated in his works. He's willing to go to such extremes to sacrifice his, his child. I kind of, I, I love analyzing the character of God because God never changes. He's the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow. And one of the character traits of God is he comes through in the 11th hour. It's not unusual. So when you get right down to it and you're like, God, where have you gone? My life is over. Tomorrow's the date. And then... Bam! God comes through. And if you step out on your faith, you will see how God acts. And it's funny, I mean, Abraham's willing to sacrifice his child. He's going to kill his own son. And here we are trying to live faithfully. I mean, some of us won't even get like non-organic dog food. For our dogs, <laughs> right? You, you got to order that thing, make sure it's the organic. <laughs> but look at how dedicated he is to God. And where's our focus in life sometimes? I mean, there's no doubt faith and works are partners. And C.S. Lewis made this point earlier, right? It's like trying to decide which blade on, on the scissors is, is more important. Well, you need to have both. And you can have both as a follower of Christ. Your works will flow from your faith. And your faith will grow as a result of your works. It's like the story of Abraham who in the darkest moments, he's about to sacrifice his son and, and God's coming through again. God intervened, and then Abraham's faith grows exponentially. When God has intervened in your life, has, has your faith grown? Man, mine has. The tough times in our lives accomplish something. Now think about this. They force us to embrace God, to move into God's arms. They force us to our knees sometimes, to lean into God, which in turn grows our faith, which in turn brings us to action. God has shown up in your life over and over again. He's with you right now. And he will show up in your life over and over again. And if you're wondering where God is right now, he will show up again. You got to ask him to manifest the Holy Spirit within you. You've probably heard stuff like, 
Faith is like a muscle. You've heard this one? All right. If you're a big muscle guy like Joe, just lives in the gym, yeah, he likes to sit down. Now make his arms bigger for you and everything, right? But faith is like a muscle. You, you got to work it out. You got to exercise it. You got to make it stronger. But what's the issue with the gym, man? Oh, I can't get to the gym every day. It's good. Right? We don't, we don't hit the gym any, every day, but we're well-intentioned. How many got exercise bikes that, that you hang laundry on? <laughs> right? I mean, I'm telling you. But not all of us are, are willing to step out in that comfort zone into situations that will stimulate our growth. We just sit there and, and we're comfortable in our, our day-to-day. But these are some of the moments where we see our faith grow the most through suffering, through pain, through hardship, through, through persecution. And maybe for James, maybe for us today in this politically explosive world, you're losing hope. We're praying for Ukraine. We're praying for Russia. We are praying for this world. And it's so easy to, to just lose hope these days and go, God, where, where are you? And James is inspiring the church to, to keep going, to fight the good fight. And, and the Apostle Paul, faith without action is dead. And that's exactly the kind of blunt truth that James is hitting them with. The early church needed to hear this. And I am sure that this is the blunt truth that we need to hear today. Get back to church. Join a community of faith. We got it easy compared to other cultures. My baby G had someone spend the night two nights ago whose sister's in a bomb shelter. We got it easy. And they're praying for us, hoping that we will pray for them. Believers all around the world are facing very real life death and persecution and war on their faith. Their experience of, of faith is, is completely different from ours. So today I want to encourage you. Thank you, Jesus. We are so lucky. To find ways this week to put your faith into action. Don't get too comfortable. Don't, don't get too complacent. Allow yourself to enter into situations that will stretch your faith, that will grow your faith. And if you are a believer and you go, I got, God's got 99% of me. What's that 1% that you are hoarding? What is it? Is that your time? Is that your bank account? What is it that you are, are hoarding, you're, you're holding on to? God wants your 100% faithfulness. Pray that God will give you the courage to step out on faith. And please remember, the world is so hungry for Jesus right now. And we are God's chosen ambassadors. He chose you. You as his ambassador to spread his message. Let your faith and your works define you for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I can see how faith and action, they work together as one. They're in one file folder, Lord. I can see that there are times when I just, I, I get too comfortable in my life, in my faith. I give you 99%, but I, I hoard something, I hold on to something, and, and by doing that, you can't, or you won't bless it. And I need to show my faith 
so you can bless it. And I forget to walk every day in righteousness and action. Dear Lord, give me the courage and strength to have both faith and works that bring you glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship.